Welcome everyone to the SSPIY's September All Members Meeting. Today we have an excellent panel of entrepreneurs invited to speak with to us uh, by our mentoring working group. But before we get started, I did want to note a few things. Um, first, we mentioned Deborah Factor uh, being honored with Mentoring of the Year Award last time. But uh, I also did want to congratulate Justina, who's our STEM working group lead, one of our STEM working group leads, uh, who will be inaugurated to this year's class of 20 under 35. Um, check out the class in the link in the chat. Let me just send it really quick. And then um, next, we are get, looking to give people an opportunity to speak um, at various occasions, whether it's a podcast or future all member meeting panels. So if you'd like to share your specialty and want to be considered, please fill out the speaker profile, which the link will also be in the chat. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Andrea Malater, who is one of our leads for the mentoring working group to introduce our panelists. Andrea? Thanks, jo Thanks Jomia. And we do have a, a good panel of mentors and um, someone who's benefiting from the mentors um, to talk about entrepreneurship. And these are women who have um, a lot of different experience uh, with uh, starting companies as well as running companies. And um, as Mary and I discussed, we had a chat earlier today, um, the good idea to uh, start off this uh, discussion, which has to do with starting up a company and doing something which doesn't always work, with a great quote I recently saw from Nelson Mandela, which is, I never lose, I either win or learn. And that's what entrepreneurship is about. You, No matter what, you learn something. Uh, so Mary Frost, who has... Um, many decades of experience in a wide range of satellite um, telecommunications and uh, broadcasting and other things, and has been CEO of at least three companies um, and has started up a number of companies uh, herself um, with varying degrees of success, but she always learned. Uh, then we have Susan Irwin, who um, has started her own company, branched out from working for the government to start up her own uh, consulting firm many decades ago, and um, helped a lot of other companies um, in the industry uh, through her consulting, many of whom were starting out. So not just her own experience in starting and running a company, but her experience helping them um, with uh, their work. Uh, Andy Steinem, who has a, uh, a really interesting range of, of <laughs> experience, uh, everything from uh, Hill Stafford to construction to um, telecommunications industry to running her own um, executive search firm for, again, uh, a number of decades in, in which not only has she started a company and run a company, uh, which actually has offices on US and the UK, but she has worked as um, an executive search person for companies who were starting up. So understanding what they do and so entrepreneurship from that other perspective. And finally, finally, uh, Dasha Tishek, who is someone who is the newest member of the entrepreneur group and who has uh, just recently uh, started up um, her own businesses. And as I understand, and gosh, you can say if I've got this right or not, uh, part of what she's doing is actually helping, not only doing her own work, but helping other entrepreneurs uh, by providing uh, support um, and uh, different kinds of uh, expertise to them. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary to start and uh, go Mary. Well, actually, um, hi, everybody. Um, I was thinking about starting up and I was first wanted to make the point that you can start up within your own company, wherever you are. When I was at um, PBS Channel 13, I started video conferencing, which is actually where I first met Susan Irwin. Um, when I went to ABC, I was hired because of my satellite experience that I had from WNET Channel 13 video conferencing, and I started the satellite desk there. And later I started um, the KU band uh, satellite news gathering system for the US. And that was all within ABC, Disney ABC TV network. I also worked in uh, sports, 
uh, with a Knicks basketball player. That was interesting because he didn't have any rules, but it was his money. So we did things the way he liked to do them. Um, other startups, um, I was always driven by a passion for technology. So the first thing I would say is you need a passion. And for me, I just fell in love with technology. And within that technology, it was primarily satellites, uh, which was a good time to start it because they were just changing from monopolies over into um, individual ownerships. So it was a great opportunity. So part two is look for that opportunity, uh, unfilled need, a something you see that maybe someone else doesn't see. Um, boy, oh boy, you have to just keep at it. When I started my own company, I thought I had a brilliant partner, a brilliant uh, plan, business plan, and talk about unforeseen circumstances which require you to pivot. My dear friend, partner, developed cancer and died. So from a business perspective, that's a really requirement to pivot. She was essential for all of my networking and all the contacts that I needed for the grand vision that I had. So those are some of the points I just wanted to make briefly about the different experiences I've had. And you know what? As I look back, I wouldn't change any of them. Every one of them allowed me to meet great people, have great experiences, gravel all over creation. Um, really, I strongly encourage anyone who has the stamina, the grit, which you're going to hear a little bit more about later, <laughs> um, to go forward to do this if you want to. And there's, you know, just got to have the right kind of um, emotional capabilities to do that, the willingness to work like a son of a gun. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'm going to talk, uh, uh, send it over to uh, Dasha, who's just started in the last year or so, and let you tell her about her experiences like right now, because everything's changing quite rapidly with the technology and the disruptive technologies. Oh, by the way, my new passion is artificial intelligence. Love it. Can't wait to see where that goes. Dasha, it's up to you now. Go. Thank you very much. So um, my entrepreneurial story, I would say, actually started um, when I was very young. I think when I was in high school, I was trying to start like little businesses doing teaching and stuff like that. I didn't know any of the terminology, but I was always feeling like I wanted to invent my own services that I offered and I wanted to go and sell what I had ideas for to other people. And so um, this right now, StratCraft is, is the first time I'm uh, really buckled into a full uh, serious business, but I think I've I've attempted little side hustles um, all throughout my life because I just felt a draw to it. But one of the things that I've been learning as I started my journey is you need more than just a pull. So a lot of people have an aspiration, maybe an idea or a set of ideas um, that they're thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great to pursue? But it really helps to also have something driving behind you because um, I think there is a lot more ambiguity to starting a business, um, even than what you imagine when you start out. Because first of all, um, even if you have a really good idea that you've thought about for a long time, nothing, you know, no plan ever survives the test against reality. And the same thing is for your idea. Um, my business, I do uh, operational and strategy consulting and um, implementation for businesses, but um, even learning how to articulate it to the businesses that I'm targeting has been a challenge because a lot of people associate strategy consulting maybe with a company like a McKinsey or a BCG and to a smaller uh, set of companies, particularly in manufacturing and hardware technologies, which is where I'm most interested in working. Um, those, those, that terminology actually means cost center, right? And so as I've been working with many businesses, they're like, well, do I really need a strategy? My problem isn't strategy. And then they'll give me their one sentence statement on their strategy. And I'm like, well, maybe, maybe the word plan or even operational excellence is a much better way to actually enter that conversation. Cause really what a strategy is for them, it, it, they still need it, but they, they, they don't like the terminology. And a lot of the terminology that I learned um, implementing strategy in larger companies is unfamiliar and um, to many of the smaller entrepreneurs, you know, an entrepreneur who might be a mechanical engineer who has a company of 20 people 
manufacturing, you know, composite materials or running a machine shop, they, they actually don't like that terminology and they don't like the way that maybe I describe the technology. So I have to find a much more approachable way to talk about their problems and, and understand exactly how they understand their own needs so that I can bridge that gap in communication. And it, it's little things like that, but you start out, you might be going down a route for a couple months, um, kind of figuring something out. And then suddenly you realize the feedback is that this, this word, these words aren't clicking or this service isn't um, clicking with this type of company that you thought needed it. Um, so it's a, it's a constant process of discovery and um, you have to be sort of swimming and enjoying that ambiguity because if you let it stress you out, if you're like, oh man, I got it wrong. I've spent two months doing something and it's not quite right. Um, you, then you then you put a lot of that on yourself. So you have to be like, oh, it's okay. This is all a process of discovery. It's a little bit of a meandering path. As long as I see kind of a North star that I'm providing valuable services to people in the general sense of where I started my business, then I'll find that right match of what I offer and what people need. Um, and I think that's that's true for any business, whether you're developing a product, a software, you know, you might have a good sense. You might have even talked to some customers and gotten some interviews. But once you put it out there and start engaging people, mm -hmm. um, the feedback might might be different. And you have to be really flexible and not get stressed out by the differences in how you env envisioned it going versus how it's actually going. Susan, how about you? Well, um, thanks, Mary, and um, and thanks everybody that's that's on the call. Uh, this is this is really this is really fun, and I hope it's I hope it's useful. Uh, when we started talking about this workshop, I guess it was maybe three months ago or longer. Um, I came across a list of twelve steps to starting a business. Now, obviously, every business is different, and those twelve steps vary dramatically but some of them are re really apply to every every business and um and i i think that uh i'd like to tell you a little bit about how i started my business how i navigated the early steps of my business and and how it evolved um and the first of the 12 steps is one that that is so um so general and so important to every single business, every single person that's starting a business. Uh, it's to evaluate yourself and ask yourself, why do you wanna start a business? I had been involved in the early, earliest stages of the commercial satellite industry uh, at NTIA. And I was offered a position with a startup team of an exciting new venture that was setting up uh, private satellite networks using KU band satellites for training and corporate communications. I was living in Washington uh, at the time, uh, which I still am, and the company was headquartered in New York City. Uh, PSN was the name of the company, and, um, and I knew uh, that that company was growing quickly, and it was clear to me that if I was gonna grow with the company, uh, I would have to move to New York, which I did not wanna do. Uh, so I knew that I had to make a change. I had a home, a husband, and a commitment to stay in DC. Um, while I was at PSN, I had developed a strong relationship with one of the company's technology vendors, Scientific Atlanta. And the CEO of SA offered me an opportunity to work either as an employee or a consultant with their sales department uh, in marketing their new technology. And, um, and I realized uh, the, the sales force consisted, by the way, almost entirely of engineers. And I, and I realized uh, from selling um, private networks to corporate to large corporations that selling a satellite solution to a corporate non-technical customer was challenging to say the least. I did not have an engineering background, but what I did have from spending uh, the previous five years in the evolution of the commercial satellite industry was an understanding of the benefits and the applications of satellite communications and how to talk about those benefits in a language that could be understand, understood by corporate executives who were non-engineers and non-satellite savvy, 
but we're making the buying decisions. So with the promise of a monthly retainer and a contract and a one-year contract um, that would be sufficient to cover my operating expenses, I hung out my shingle and opened my consulting business, Irwin Communications, in 1985. I continued, by the way, to consult for Scientific Atlanta for 12 years, and that first client gave me the chance to grow my business and my reputation. During the life of Irwin Communications, the business evolved as the industry evolved. While the, our business started in the corporate communications and training sector, I moved quickly into the broadcasting market, which of course dominated the satellite industry for three decades. We were an early source of market research on satellite broadband and other technology trends. I spent several years as an adjunct to my consulting business in a partnership involved in sales of satellite services to DOD. I chaired an industry conference, SATCON, in New York City for 15 years. And in 2010, I started and ran the US subsidiary of Euroconsult, the international satellite and space research and consulting firm. All of these efforts involved working with teams, being flexible and experiencing wildly shifting economic and technological trends. So hang on future engineers and entrepreneurs, it's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> So oh, Andy, how about you uh, talk a little bit about your very unusual background? <laughs> okay. Um, so as 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 the others on the panel have alluded to, um, I come at it from a very diverse. Uh, as I say, I always have a bit of a checkered past, but I think we all come at this from a very different perspective. So it, I'm all good on uh, that. Helps anybody in any business that they're developing, but. I want to go back to entrepreneurship. You hear it, we hear it all the time, and it's everywhere. In my question is always, why are you doing it, and who is it who's doing it? And everybody has a different reason. And back to Mary's point of you got to look at yourself and figure out, you know, is this right for you, and are you going to do this? Um, I worked in fraud investigation. I ran a construction business. Um, I worked on the Hill. Uh, I think I've done a few things in between that don't matter. But so I came into this industry and I've run an executive search firm for the last 32 years. Um, that's a really long time, let me tell you guys. But I came into it, I was recruited to it, no pun intended. And so it was a company that was already up and running when I got there. It was six months old. And to the point that, you know, Dash was talking about, it was to address something that wasn't being addressed in the market, which was, it was a very tough economic time. The markets were completely dead and companies had not cut just to the bone, but into the bone. And so we developed a product, a service, which was the interim management as companies were starting to look at, you know, where they needed bandwidth, what they needed as, which is where, you know, you get your fractional CEOs, or your fractional CFOs. We were doing interim managers across the globe. And we started with that. Now, when I also bought the business, I inherited a name, a logo, two satellite offices, a staff and infrastructure. OK, so I came to entrepreneurship with this from a very different perspective. I had to come in and say, can we does this work? Can we support all of this infrastructure? What do we need to do in this time to move forward? Um, so when you look to start a business, my feeling is there are a couple of things that come out everywhere you go, you hear you need to be persistent. You need to have the grit. You need to have the staying power. You need to be willing to put in the work. I've worked two jobs when I started my company, trust me. Um, and be willing to just do whatever it is. You know, if it's Tuesday, you take out the trash. Who cares? But that's what an entrepreneur does. They don't stand in point. And I think that's something that's important to know. Also coming in at a tough economic time, 
it what it did for me was it gave me the opportunity to one learn my business and really spend that time because that's important as to what I was delivering, but also to learn what my customers were going to need and where they needed to go. So um, I have a short list of some of the things that I think if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you got to be willing to do the following. Um, make the tough decisions, where you're going, how fast you can get there, and what you might need to sacrifice in the interim. Um, part of the conversations are, you know, what was done 30 years ago. We talked about marketing is it has evolved because so much of it's, you know, with social media. So that's changed the dynamic in a business. Um, how much risk are you willing to take on? Um, influences, how well do you sleep at night? You know, um, I've spent many nights and my husband, you know, it's turned over with the light on going, what are you doing? I'm running numbers, you know? Um, and it's true, but it, it's part of it all. It's all good, but it's part of it. Um, be willing to have a plan, but also be willing to pivot. I started doing interim, but because one of my colleagues had been doing search, was known for search. And so we added that and that's the mainstay of my business to this day. But then I've developed other things along the lines and being willing to say, hey, does this work? Mm -hmm. To Dasha's point, you don't believe it. You go down a certain path and when you find it might not, be willing to pull the plug. Um, and then be a good steward of both the human and the financial resources entrusted to you. I think that's important. Um, you gotta be true to yourself, be true to others. Your reputation gets built that way. And as a small business, especially many of us are service businesses, that's what we live and die on. Mary, it's all yours. <laughs> oh, thanks, Sandy. <laughs> I wanted to bring up, uh, I'll reiterate maybe a few things that everyone said is one, you have to be a mission driven leader. You have to have an absolute mission. What's really different today, I think Dasha brought that up. Um, you have to be a digital leader. I mean, really, you have so many tools available to you now for marketing uh, digitally. And if you, it's going to be a requirement, really. And you have to really know how to use that. The other thing is you are the spokesman for your very own company. You're the one out front. You're making all the points. You're building your own culture. You're building your own reputation, as every single one of them mentioned. You build your reputation. Believe me, I saw so many people come into um, the satellite industry thinking they could make a quick hit. And they were kind of shysters, and they did not last. The only people who last in the satellite industry were people who um, lived up to their word and delivered what they said they would deliver. And you have to build some kind of universal accountability around that, uh, that culture that you do develop. Uh, what are some of the things that mistakes you can make? Well, you, I think you might have heard some of those too. Well, do you have um, a retainer? Do you have a way to make it? Uh, do you expect really quick success? Like, I got it. I'm going to make this successful. Um, I only need like three months, six months, maybe a year. Well, what is the best case for your company? You have to think about that. How fast can you grow? What happens? When do you bring on more people? Probably, I would ask the others to answer that question, but when do you bring on uh, additional help? Probably when you're in the um, proposal stage and you're saying, can I really do that? Or do I need an engineer for this? Do I need, what kind of person do I need to uh, help me accomplish this as you grow your company? So um, I'm working with the conference board right now and I have one CEO who's dealing with something called hyper growth. His company is growing at like double, um, it's our dream, right? Your company will grow at double the rate it should in a year, but that brings its own kinds of questions. The other side of that is what, like Andy talked about, economic downturn. We have a big recession, people being laid off like crazy. Uh, every company is cutting back. They don't have any extra money to spend on anybody. Now, how are you going to survive? What else can you do? What other products? What other markets? Um, 
the international community is always looking to the U.S. market. So if you have an opportunity there, you can represent an international company coming into this market uh, very often. Um, other points I just wanted to make probably is the thing that Andy mentioned. It's called grit. I thought we might have a slide. Um, do we have that slide about grit? Did anybody do that? No, I have to read that quote then, and then I'm going to ask everyone to go back around again and ask them for their response. So this is kind of the, uh, from uh, Deborah Sweeney, who is a VP and general manager of the Deluxe Corporation. The most successful entrepreneurs are the ones who, who possess grit. Grit is made up of persistence, passion, resilience. It's the passion to achieve long-term goals, the courage to try again, fall down, just get up and try again in the face of rejection, the will to do something better than it's ever been done before. The most successful entrepreneurs tend to be the gritty ones. They do not give up until they exceed their goals. When the going gets tough, they get knocked down, gritty entrepreneurs bounce right back up and try again. So that kind of summarizes it. I think it, we'd love to see some questions. Um, from you all, ask us what you think. I mean, this is your opportunity to find out from all of us who have been through this a few times, um, what kinds of questions you have, whether it's about resources or timelines or anything. I mean, also Andrea, you know, she worked for Price Waterhouse. We both did and consulted for a lot of companies there. So um, we know what the big, um, advisors provide in the way of expertise as well. But uh, there's plenty of room for everybody with the right expertise. What do you think, Andrea? Well, actually I'm picking up, uh, tying that to something that uh, Jamea put in the chat um, about the importance of uh, communicating to people of different backgrounds and um, reflecting on um, engineers specifically or experience who focus too much on their specialty that they forget how it's relevant in the bigger picture. And I think that's uh, part of uh, what you're getting at and what uh, Mandy and Susan also talked about, which is um, understanding this one thing that you have a passion for that you know that you think you can do, Dasha mentioned also, and how um, how does that fit um, into a larger universe, um, how does that help not just the first two companies that you think of who could benefit or the first two customers who you think of who can benefit, but um, what is the, the broader opportunity, uh, which is also tied back to being able to pivot and being able to look so that if you are focused on one thing or one customer or one customer set, and then it turns out that there's a problem with that, whether it's a recession or 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 whatever. Um, if you have an idea of the bigger uh, picture and the bigger uh, opportunity, uh, you can then pivot to somebody else who could also use it. So that's kind of what I I uh, think of. Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask Susan and then Dasha both about when did you when do you decide to take a partner? or another resource. I know, Susan, you went with Euro Consult. When did you decide to do that and why? Well, um, Mary, uh, I, I, met Susan Irwin. I took on multiple partners uh, at different times for different reasons. Uh, and and it was, um, uh, Euro Consult was a, was a significant shift in, in my business because I basically integrated my business into into Euroconsult because they, uh, I had done, I had partnered with them on some uh, projects, on some research and consulting projects, and worked out well. And they did not have a corporate entity in the United States, so uh, so they asked me, the the uh, the CEO and the the upper management asked me if I would head up, if I would start and head up. Um, a U.S. subsidiary, uh, and and so that was, and and I thought that was a really good opportunity for first of all for me to use my network and my expertise. Secondly, to grow their business, which was already uh, significant and, and and highly you know uh, recognized in the U.S. Um, and so that's 
that was that was a you know a big change for me. Other partners that I took on, for example, when I when I had a partnership to sell um, satellite services to uh, DoD, uh, I I had and all of my partnerships were based on relationships. By the way, I had had relationships. I had worked with people in in different contexts, and we there was an opportunity um, in in terms of the DoD sales. Uh, it, you know, it was an opportunity to move my business in in another direction. Uh, although I continued to do my my basic business, so you know, dif different reasons. But I, but I think also it, it's it's important um, to add that you know how you grow your business, whether through employees, through subcontractors, freelancers, or partnerships, is very is a very important aspect of of running uh, an entrepreneurial venture. And I I did all of those. Uh, but you have to determine when is the right time to hire employees, when is the right time to, you know, hire subcontractors, um, when is the right time to, to get work with a partner. And, and those are some of the factors that I think you have to take into consideration and, and that I did for my various iterations of my business. Sasha? Yeah, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Mary. Um, first, I'll, I'll go back a little bit to the question on communicating to people of different backgrounds and then particularly in working with engineers and then kind of uh, transition to the partner question. Um, so I think it's it's very important to be self-aware if you're going to be an entrepreneur, because when you start a business, especially if you're starting just on your own, but even if you have a partner, you know, everything is is coming from within yourself. You are creating everything. And so everything is very much a direct reflection of what you're like. If you are strong in certain areas, your business will probably be strong in that. If you have a, an area of weakness or an area where you're a little bit maybe blind or inexperienced, that's where your business is going to be weak. So if you're a finance person, you're probably going to be really thoughtful about your financial models. You're going to have good forecasting and planning. But maybe you have other areas that are weak. Maybe you're not thinking about your talent growth or delegation. If you're an engineer, you might be more focused on the product side of things. And you might forego some of the customer service processes or what's the experience of people? How do they find your business? So you have to think about what areas of your business um, you're probably the spearhead of and you're going to probably over invest in because that's your specialty and that's your strength. And then you also have to think, okay, where am I going to possibly struggle? And it's good to be humble about it because you're building an entire business. So it's not like being a little bit like, you know, if you're not good at something, um, acknowledging that, you know, just acknowledging it means that you might go and educate yourself or find an advisor or find a friend who can help out a little bit or uh, get a consultant. You know, there's so many ways you can start to address that, find a community of people who are good at that. But being aware is going to be really, really helpful. And um, my business, Shirecraft Partners, is basically based on the observation I had working in um, manufacturing and hardware, both med tech and then in uh, the communications industry, that a lot of the really good companies that have great technologies are sometimes really missing somebody who thinks about the customer's experience and the overall like marketing business development plan, because oftentimes they're founded by engineers who are exceptionally good at the technology side of things. And one of the results of that is sometimes that engineers, um, because they are, some of them are not so good at the marketing, business development, customer service side of things, they don't even know how to find a person who is good at that. So they um, will sometimes like get somebody into their business who's actually maybe like a sleazy, salesy person who, who lies because they're like, I think that's what good sales looks like, right? They're like, I think it's just about charm and, you know, because it's an area where they lack that skill. So being aware of what you lack is immediately helpful to figuring out, okay, this is where I'm most likely to, to make mistakes. I need a strong, uh, a strong solution to this later down the road, whether it's a partner or something like that. And I'm, and, and you might need to assess that very thoroughly and not just rely on your instincts if it's an area where, where you struggle. So 
so it's it's very it's actually a very good question, very important. Um, for myself, I have chosen at this point to uh, not have a partner, and that's for a couple of different reasons. One is um, I, I I do have community. So one way I'm addressing both my own gaps and also not feeling like I'm going at it alone is uh, by getting involved in an entrepreneurial community of people with similar businesses to mine, just in different industries and different areas, so that I'm continuously learning from them, having an area where I can get support, people who are further along than me in their path who can advise me. And also within those groups, I have a couple of people that I've really clicked with. Actually, uh, Michelle Page is here on, uh, with me and, and we're doing collaborations together. So for example, I've joined a, a women's or fractional executive network where everybody has a business similar, but you know, some are CTOs, some are CMOs, and we collaborate together to put out content, um, to, to do learning and um, it, it advise each other. So, so collaborations is one way that I'm addressing it is um, with other independent business owners and community. Another reason I kind of chose not to do it at this point is I really want to have a strong uh, sense of where my business is going before I involve somebody else. Cause you have, I'm very strong personality and like a little bit willful. Um, and so to bring in another person like myself, I feel that there would be a lot of time spent probably just trying to like figure out pulling in different directions. I think having an established direction and something that I've built up is going to make it easier for me to figure out what kind of partner I need and to bring somebody in maybe who um, is maybe good going with my vision. Cause it's, it's hard at these early stages, the negotiations piece of it as well. So um, I want to feel that I formulated a strong basis before I bring in a partner. Really Mary, interesting. Really have other questions? Mary. Mary, I'm going to switch you on because I don't know if you're checking the chat, but there are two questions that I think really apply to you, uh, which and one of which you talked about a little bit, which is how you switch your brain from employee mode to entrepreneur mode. And related to that is what convinced you to, to leave a bigger organizations, which is what you worked at, like ABC, and um, and go on the entrepreneurship path and take the, the risk. So when, how how and why did you make those uh, shifts? Okay, I'll go first, but then Andy has a, a pretty interesting approach to that too. I am, as I said, I have a passion for technology. And when I kind of feel like I'm in a steady state, I almost get bored and I want to be challenged. And that's a unique and probably not a positive part of my personality, but it's just what I have to deal with. So basically, when I felt like I wasn't going to be able to grow anymore very quickly, then opportunities came my way and I took them. I didn't take them for the money usually. I usually <laughs> I took them for the the interest I had. And and often it was something I didn't know, as Dasha said, I did not know a lot about sports. You couldn't ask me all the rules of hockey. And yet when I was working with the uh, basketball player, I did know basketball. I did know football, did not know hockey, but you're entertaining owners of hockey teams and it's, mm, you've got to be careful. So I found it, but I all found that fascinating and interesting to me. So I guess I'm a little bit fearless uh, that way. Reckless might be another word. Um, one of our dear friends of the satellite ladies said to me once, you know, Mary, some people can't hold a job. You can't hold a career. But the fact is I can hold a career. It just has to be associated with new technologies, basically. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. If that helps explain, which it probably doesn't. And Andy, what about you? Well, you know, my background's not been really as much with large companies. And when I've come into the small ones, um, I actually started with a partner. When when I bought Del Moro, which was only six months old, so it was it was a startup, um, and it didn't work. So I learned very early on because expectations don't always work. Um, I've learned over the years, you know, they always say, you know, the toddler's kids never have any shoes, right? Well, I run a search firm and I'm recruiting teams for people. So, you know, that's an, always an interesting one. I've made mistakes when I've hired. Now, I've always had W-2 employees. 
And that's worked because I felt that people were more invested. But then I've developed partnerships, to your point, Susan, of you bring in other resources when the time is right. If I've been working on a, a huge project, I've staffed whole divisions for companies. And sometimes you need additional resources. But it's been a relationship base. It's a trust. I'm a firm believer that as a small business in particular, we we develop our business because of who we are and people want to work with us or they don't. And that's really key. Um, I don't know that that answer is going from an employee to an entrepreneur because I've always been more on the entrepreneurial side or the small business side. But I think you look at who you bring into your organization um, and you know, there's an adage of, you know, slow to hire, quick to, or slow to hire, quick to fire. Um, you want to make sure it's the right fit because Dasha, to your point, you don't want to be fighting with somebody that doesn't get you very far. And I've seen many startups, entrepreneurs, brilliant individuals, but they, they don't understand the smart ones have a self-awareness. I'm dealing with a client now who knows what they're good at and to learn to let go of the baby a little bit and, and bring in the team that can support them and help them grow because that's what they need. And that's the tough part for somebody who's got a great idea, it's, it's theirs, but they need to realize then going forward, whether it's advisors who can help them see it, whether it's other team members, but then being able to say, okay, I'm gonna go do this because that's what I'm really good at. And let's bring in that person who's gonna help us get to that next stage. And I can, I can provide that oversight in my way. So I think that's key to growing a business as well. Uh, and so Amy, me, I, as, I just, uh, go ahead, Susan. You know, I just wanted to comment on, on a couple of things that, that Andy said. Um, uh, and and also on the going from uh, from a large company to uh, becoming an entrepreneur and starting a business, and um, I've worked uh, as a consultant to a number a number of companies that um, and and a number of, and I have had contacts in within my network of uh, of contacts with with a lot of people who have started um, who have either started or tried to start. A um, an entrepreneurial venture, and for various reasons, it didn't work. I, I think you know a lot of senior executives, um, and this also goes for uh, um, in in the military people who are retired from the military and go into the corporate world. Uh, senior executives who've been very successful for their whole careers, uh, and and then retire or for various reasons, you, you know, leave the company and and try to start their own businesses, they don't have the grit and they don't understand um, what's involved in, in moving from a structured environment where they've got, you know, divisions that, you know, I never had an IT division, you know, I, I was it, right? I had to hire people if I needed help with, with IT problems, which I, which I did. Uh, constantly still do um but you know people that uh that go from a structured uh large organization to becoming an entrepreneur and think that because they were successful in the in the large organization or in a structured environment um that they will be successful as um as consultants uh and it and it doesn't necessarily work because they don't really know what's involved and it, Right, you can't do everything yourself, but you have to do a lot yourself. So uh, that, that those are some lessons that I've that I've seen learned in a in a and and have seen people struggle with who try to start their own businesses. I uh, support that, uh, Susan wholeheartedly from Price Waterhouse. I would often talk or meet with founders of companies that have been successful, and they needed a succession plan and. They just were micromanagers that couldn't let go enough. So the question I wanted to send back to Andy is, would you hire entrepreneurs um, to work in a big company? That's a that's a pretty broad question. It's a good question. Because I go more to where I have more of the conversation that Susan brings up. Um, yes, in the right environment. I think anybody can succeed 
if it's the right environment. And questions I always ask, I work with a lot of separating military, senior military, to your point. Um, I remember one colonel I placed with a client of mine, and I said to my client two years later, I said, how's he doing? He's like, he finally got the birds off his shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, no kidding. <laughs> so, you know, um, and, and, and the military has a tough time. I've seen so many fail because, you know, in the military, you know, you point and shoot and that's where they go. And when they go into a commercial environment, they need to understand um, it doesn't work that way. You know, this is communication changes. I've seen some make a very successful pivot. So yes, I would put an entrepreneur in, but it ha would have to be an entrepreneurial company. There are a lot of large companies who have that infrastructure and start up a lot of things, but it just, you know, and you've seen a lot of the old standards, the IBMs, the Cisco's, um, the HP's, who've tried to pivot in various ways. Some of them do a really good job and some of them do an abysmal job. So I find that anybody who's going to get into this has to really just sort of do a deep dive on themselves of, you know, are you going to be able to do it? Are you going to be able to pivot? And are you going to be able to say, this is what I'm good at and I'm going to work my butt off and I'm going to learn these other pieces, but I'm going to find somebody else who's got, who can support me. And whether that's an outside source, whether that's somebody you bring in and bring up. I mean, I used to do a lot with my team where I would push them to the edge of their comfort zone until they'd finally go, stop. And it was good. It made them reach. It made them grow. But then I realized at that point, they didn't want to go any further. And that's where they were good. So you got to, as an entrepreneur, look at what you can do and where you can grow and also those that you work with as well. Mary, there, there was a question that I think um, um, was interesting for you to respond to, which has to do with uh, funding and getting uh, initial seed funding and getting funding before you have uh, a product. And But how do you build a product without having funding? And I'm thinking in particular of your uh, sports-related um, uh, project, uh, which is one that did require hardware and uh, um, a lot of other things. So um, where do you, how do you balance that, um, uh, that question? Who was the question for, Andrea? Well, I'm putting that to question? you. Oh. I'm well, putting that to you, thinking in particular, as I said, of your, you know, um, uh, your William uh, project, which is something that required I mean, consulting, starting a consulting business or even an executive search business or even the kinds of um, uh, um, fractional uh, uh, strategy business that uh, Dasha has does not necessarily require the same level of funding as a business that involves hardware. You need more CapEx on a hardware yeah. business. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, that actually, it's a really good point. Where do you get your money? Uh, but I'm just going to warn Michelle Page that I'm going to ask her a question in a second. So to give you time, like, why in the world did you work with Dasha? So you can think about that while I answer the other question, okay? My point on funding is, where do you get your funding? You can be self-funded, uh, God help you, if you empty out your 401k, uh, something like that. The best shot is to have a retainer to start with, as Susan did, where you have a good customer that will keep you going for a while. That's a good start. Your next shot is angel investors. They're going to take a piece of, you're going to take your arm off when they give you some money. And then after the angel investors comes the next level of investors, probably five to 10 million, maybe 25 million. They're going to take the other arm and the leg as well, probably. So you're going to lose your company. And at some point, once you reach that 51% mark, you're going to lose control of your company and they will have control to fire you. And that's why you see so many times founders being replaced by CEOs because their board decides, oh, they're not moving fast enough or they're not um, they're not taking it in the direction that we think it should go or we want to merge you with 14 other companies just so you look like a really big company in a short amount of time. Those are the vulture capitalist approach. So you really have to be very careful who you take your money from and when you take your money from them. 
And the further you can go, owning the most of your own company is the strongest uh, approach for yourself, the healthiest. And also when you do sell it out, that brings up one of the big points. One of the things you really have to know about yourself is, do I want to be like the uh, Silicon Valley types? I'm going to spin up a company in three years and sell it to somebody really big. That's one approach. Do you want to just have total control of your own self, your own company for your whole life? Uh, go it alone, or do you want to partner and at what point, for what occasion? Uh, maybe you want to have a life after that. So you decide, well, it'd be good to have a partner so I could have a life. So there's many ways to get your funding, and um, you can find it all by a little research. But all I would say is just be really careful who you take your money from and in what time frame as you build your business. And with that, I want to go back to Michelle Page and ask her why she decided to work with Dasha and why it benefits you? Um, well, simply put, the first time I spoke with Dasha, it was uh, simply a meet and greet after one of our group networking um, meetings. And she was brilliant. <laughs> I was just struck by the fact that not only was she incredibly smart, um, she was poised. She was business wise. She was life wise. And uh, she said she was strong spirited and strong willed. We were such kindred spirits because I'm very much the same way, but we didn't butt heads. And I thought, you know what, this is someone I can work with. This is someone that can probably work with me, <laughs> but we can, we can maintain our identities. So she has her business. I have my business, but we help each other. We support each other and we're not looking to see what we can get from each other. We're looking to see what we can grow for each other. And recently we have found a shared way that we can grow each of our brands, potentially plant the seeds to grow something together. But Right now, we want to maintain our anonymity, not anonymity, autonomy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a late riser, late worker. So, so this is my first meeting of the day. Um, we want to raise, uh, maintain autonomy over our companies and our brands. Um, but I'm primarily uh, business development, revenue growth, marketing. So that side of the house. Dasha does strategy, operations, planning, kind of coordinating the entirety of the company and the other side of the house. So we really complement each other. So I'm just thrilled to be working with her. That's you, fantastic. I, I appreciate you know, I that very much. Every time I meet you, Dasha, or every time uh, we talk about you, Dasha. <laughs> Yeah, I hope you don't mind, Dasha. We're just talking about you like you're not even there, you know, but uh, at yeah, least it was all good. I had no idea what she might say. So I just thought it would be fun to ask her. Well, I told Dasha. her yesterday, um, we had a, an event yesterday where we were both on a panel and um, I was uh, not prepared to be on screen today, <laughs> uh, but we were both on a panel and we were uh, talking about how it went. And I said, you know, Dasha, I wish I was as wise as you are at your when I was your age. I said, hell, I wish I was as wise as you are at my age. <laughs> Michelle, you were so kind. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, as we're getting close to, to the end of our hour, I want to um, put something to Dasha, uh, since it is the mentor, mentoring working group that has you know, pulled this together. And um, Andy and Susan and Mary uh, and I have all been mentors within the SSPI WISE program. And Dasha um, has been started out on the other side as a mentee. And while we, we one of the important things about the process is that we do maintain confidentiality of what goes on between the mentor and the mentee. But I would like to ask Dasha if she um, has something that anything she might like to share about why uh, the mentoring program um, has been useful for her because it started just before she was starting as she was getting ready to start her, her um, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, her latest entrepreneurial adventure. And as we're getting ready to start thinking about um, setting up a new cohort of mentors and mentees. So at the end of the year, so it would be good to have a little uh, uh, bit of uh 
Dasha's input on why the program is a good one. Well, I think um, this really short story will illustrate it very well. So uh, Mary is actually my mentor and um, she and I uh, got together on a call and she was asking me about my long-term future vision. And so I was describing that I love strategy and I love formulating it, making it into a plan, helping a company really see their path to a big, bright future. Um, and and you know, it was in the context of wh where do you see yourself in ten or ten or fifteen years? So I was describing that, and and Mary goes to me, "Yeah, you're going to do that a lot sooner than you think." <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it gave me a lot of pause to to first of all, it was um, it, it gave me a lot of pause because here was somebody with a lot of experience, sort of. Um, validating that this is a possible future for me. And also that maybe I am um, not giving myself some credit for where I am relative to that possibility. And it, it made me really consider, um, what if I did it sooner? Like, what if I actually thought to do it now? <laughs> um, and and so for about a year, a little bit more over that, I, I noodled on it. I picked out the name Stratcraft probably a few months after um, that that conversation and I, I started putting together a website another three months after that it was very badly done and I um, I wasn't really ready to jump ship from my company at the time that I was working at um, I still had a lot of unfinished work but then um, about a year to year and a half uh, of that it, it suddenly the moment came and I was like you know what um, I said, this is maybe something I'll do in 10 years, but actually I've laid down the path because I was challenged to think about how I might do that sooner and, and what if, whether I'm ready sooner and not wait for it to sort of fall on me, but rather um, go ahead and, and, and grasp it once, once I felt that the timing was right. And so um, it actually, uh, it was like the first step was actually in the mentorship meeting with Mary that I, I seriously said, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe I'm going to do this sooner and I'm going to do it differently than I thought it was going to look. Uh, I might not be waiting for this to come in a corporate setting, but rather, um, go the entrepreneurial route. Well, now if that's not an, a commercial for our mentoring group, I don't know what is. That's amazing, Dasha. And congratulations, Mary, for being the inspiration that caused Dasha to start her business. Andy, uh, last words here? No, we just hope, you know, some of this is takeaways and food for thought, I guess, more than anything else. And um, that's all. And there's lots of business plans and prescriptions out there that you can find, uh, you, you know, for the basics. What we wanted to give you today was our inside stories of um, the things that we've attempted or tried or whatever. And um, you have some experience, long-term experience and some very new experience. So I hope you uh, can take away from this a, a lot of uh, insights, I would say. And back to Andrea then. Well, I just go back to Nelson Mandela and you, you don't lose, you either win or you learn. And I think that's an important message for all of us. And if you didn't notice, anybody didn't notice in the chat, Dini has uh, put uh, links for people who might want to uh, be part of the mentoring program. And um, I, I, I want to thank uh, Susan and Mary and Andy and Dasha for sharing all your stories and your insights and uh, uh, just appreciate it. And uh, I'll let Tamara or Jamia talk about what's coming up next month. Well, I was just going to end it there. So <laughs> Tamara, you want you wanted to say anything? Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So yes. Um, first of all, Thank you for this really exceptional um, exploration of the idea of, of entrepreneurship. I learned a lot. I learned things that I find found surprising, and I hope that was true of everyone. Uh, next month, uh, we will be having a conversation on the topic of allyship, um, and we are excited to be welcoming members of the 20 under 35 cohort for this year. 
to help us with that conversation. So I hope everyone is able to come next next month. Uh, of course, it's the fourth Thursday of the month. It will be at an odd time. It will be at noon, which is a different time for us as PIYs. But, uh, but it's a time that I think works for a lot of time zones. So we're going to give it a shot. And, uh, and you'll be seeing announcements and signups for that very soon. Um, I also am bragging a little bit because uh, just today, my uh, podcast with uh, the company Nuco came out. And so that's, uh, that's in your news feeds or on LinkedIn or somewhere. Um, so if you have a chance to listen in on that and have some feedback for me, I very much welcome it. And with that, thank you everyone for your participation. Please take note of all the uh, information in the chat. Oh, last but not least, next month, which is literally starts on Sunday, but next month, um, we are of course gonna be in, in Mountain View, California, of course, uh, Silicon Valley Space Week. SSPI is having a uh, the Future Leader Celebration where we will be honoring the 20 under 35. And we will find out for the very first time ever who the Promise Award winners for 2023 are. We will also be hearing from Mentor of the Year and SSPI Wise Chairwoman Deborah Factor. Super excited about this. But also, um, we are also behind the scenes, busily working on creating a little networking opportunity specifically for uh, SSPIY. So again, keep your eyes open for news and announcements about that. And with that, I'm two minutes over. So thank you everyone for this excellent opportunity to uh, share together. And thank you, Mary, Andy, Susan, and Dasha. Um, this has been exceptional. So thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.